Okay. Uh, uh, again, uh, a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on whichever part of the world we are logging in today. And uh, welcome to the, uh, the, um, the next installment, the fifth lecture in this uh, journey, uh, The Mysteries of the Universe uh, uh, at uh, the Institute Lecture Series hosted by the Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee. And uh, today we, it is, a, it is a, a matter of special and particular delight, especially for me, uh, to have Professor T.V. Ramakrishnan as uh, our distinguished speaker in the series. And uh, there is uh, at least a pair of reasons for that. As already mentioned uh, before the first talk uh, by Professor Tony Leggett uh, uh, this year, I think that was Jan 9th, uh, Professor Ramakrishnan is in fact, uh, is and has been the major driving force and the inspiration behind the second installment of this, what is now known as the MOU part two, MOU ILS part two series, the Mysteries of the Universe series. And um, uh, I, I'm sure uh, he needs no introduction, uh, but uh, uh, I would certainly venture to give one so uh, Professor Ramakrishnan is a distinguished associate um, in the Department of Physics at IIC Bangalore. He's the uh, Department of Atomic Energy, or DAE Homi Bhabha Professor uh, at BHU, uh, which is Banaras Hindu University. And there's also the Department of Science and Technology, DST in short, Year of Science Chair Professor. He did his PhD from Columbia under uh, the supervision of uh, Professor uh, Luttinga. Uh, and uh, during the period of 1978 through 81, uh, while being a visiting fellow at Princeton and also a consultant at Bell Labs, uh, along with the, not other than uh, Philip Anderson and uh, some of his colleagues, uh, uh, he is world renowned for uh, proposing the scaling theory of localization and the diagrammatic many body perturbation theory of quantum interference as a mechanism of weak or incipient localization. He has an incredibly long list of awards and honors, and uh, I would just uh, mention some of the uh, prominent ones are the same. So uh, Professor Ramakrishnan uh, uh, was uh, awarded the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award for Physical Sciences in 82, uh, the, third, the Third World Academy of Sciences Award in Physics in 1990, uh, the Alumni Award for Excellence in Research at IC Bangalore uh, in 1997, the C.V. Raman Centenary Medal of the Indian Science Congress in 2001, uh, and uh, Padma Shri by the President of India in 2001, the Meghnath Saha Medal of the Asiatic Society of Kolkata in 2002, the Distinguished Material Scientist of the Year uh, Award by uh, the Materials Research Society of India in 2004, uh, he was, uh, he became the fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences in Bangalore in 1980, the Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi, 1984, uh, the fellow of the American Physical Society uh, in 1984, uh, member of the fellow of the Third World Academy of Sciences, Trieste, in 1991, uh, the, and of course, the fellow of the National Academy of Sciences in Allahabad in 1993. Uh, he became the uh, fellow of the Royal Society, London, in 2000. Uh, fellow of the Institute of Physics uh, in 2000 again. Um, he was uh, elected as a foreign associate in uh, Académie des Sciences, the Academy of Sciences in Paris in 2005, and uh, honorary associate of IACS Kolkata in 2006. Uh, he has delivered, uh, for example, the KS Krishnan Award uh, lecture uh, at the International Science Academy in Delhi, 1997. He's given uh, the Meghnath Saha Memorial Lecture at the National Academy of Sciences, Alabama, in 2001. Um, uh, he has been uh, invited speakers at uh, a host of uh, uh, meetings and symposia, for example, the Nobel Symposium 73 in Grafval in Sweden uh, in June, 1988 and uh, the topic being physics and low dimensional systems. Uh, he was invited to uh, uh, give a talk at, the critic at a conference held to commemorate 250 years of Princeton in August 96, titled uh, Critical Problems in Physics. And um, 
there was a conference uh, which was organized in honor of uh, Philip Anderson in, at Aspen in 2000. And he was uh, an invited speaker there, which was, uh, the topic was 50 years of uh, Kinesis Matter Physics. Uh, he has also given lectures at Frontiers in Physics, which was uh, there to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Abdus Salam ICTP Trieste in 2004. Uh, he is a member, uh, he's been the member of the scientific councils of uh, the International Center for Theoretical Physics, or ICTP as already mentioned during the period 94 through 2003. Uh, DST, which is Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, 1994 through 2000. Uh, the Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics, Kolkata, 95 through 2003. Uh, IACS, which is the Indian Association for Cultivation of Science, Kolkata, 2004 through 2008. Uh, also, he's, on, he's a member of the Science Advisory Council uh, to the Prime Minister uh, since 2005. Uh, he, had, he was a Vice President of the International Science Academy 2002 through 2003. He was a President of the Indian Academy of Sciences 2004 to 2006. One can go on, but I, we need to stop somewhere. So I think uh, with that, I would very humbly request uh, Professor Ramakrishnan to please deliver his lecture. Professor Ramakrishnan. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Mishra. Uh, I'm really very um, grateful to you for uh, giving me this opportunity to give this talk. Uh, actually, <laughs> I was wondering whether your introduction would end or not. Fortunately, it has ended. Uh, and uh, let us not worry about what it says. Uh, I thought uh, I would uh, talk about uh, four uh, frontiers of physics. Uh, where I take the point of view uh, that uh, the mysteries of the universe as uh, uh, perceived in most physicists are ap apparent at its uh, frontiers. Uh, now, uh, what are these frontiers? Well, in the physicist world, uh, there are three broad frontiers which are interconnected, which are connected to other sciences. Uh, these are the small, the large, and the complex. Um, now, um, there is a fourth frontier, the unclear, which is noticed uh, now and then. Uh, now, in this series, there will be many uh, lectures by world leaders who have explored these frontiers on the mysteries in these frontiers and of uh, unraveling, unraveling these mysteries in many cases. Uh, personally, I have worked in the area of the complex, uh, which... Uh, actually goes by the name of uh, condensed matter physics, used to be called solid state physics, as also squalid state physics. Uh, what I say will be uh, obviously conditioned by this experience. Uh, what I will do in this talk is to first mention two broad reasons why this area uh, can harbor uh, mysteries. Uh, then I will talk about a general example and also later <clears throat> about my encounters with uh, two mysteries. Uh, since examples from the uh, two other frontiers, namely the large and the small, uh, have been and will be described by others, I will briefly touch on the untouchable frontier, which is the fourth frontier. Uh, see, the uh, conventional view of most physicists, including me, is uh, that uh, the uh, mysteries may reside in the constituents and in their laws of motion as they might or might not uh, appear clearly at different scales. For example, the Schrodinger equation atomic or subatomic scale, uh, Newton's laws of motion at our scale, and various appropriate forms of these. Uh, so... Uh, it is incumbent on us as physicists to uh, make an inward bound journey to find the smallest constituents and their laws of motion. Now, the motive force in this is uh, uh, the belief in a philosophy which might be called reductionism, uh, which is the belief that once the constituents and the laws of motion driving their dynamics uh, are known, the rest is chemistry. That is, basically putting together of uh, uh, these um, laws. Uh, this is uh, uh, goes by the name of constructionism. Now, this is the, as I said, this is the underlying mental makeup of most of us physicists. 
and our approach to the external world. We are very um, clearly aware of the great successes and of the mysteries which this approach reveals. Uh, I uh, would like to say that uh, there are two reasons why the frontier of the complex, which is neither small nor large, may not be interesting just in terms of uh, richness of phenomena, but also is likely to harbor basic mysteries. Uh, these two reasons are emergence and the amazing diversity of nature. Uh, emergence means uh, that uh, new phenomena, new properties emerge when you put things together. These uh, do not often make sense for uh, the con constituents. They are consistent with the laws of motion, but are not uniquely predicted by these. Uh, so I will spend a few minutes talking about these uh, in somewhat uh, general philosophical terms. Uh, first, I will start with emergence. Uh, about which uh, physicists became aware uh, roughly around the early 70s through a pioneering and highly influential article on this uh, subject by P.W. Anderson called More is Different. Now, I will simply repeat a few sentences from that article. Uh, first, the ability to reduce everything to simple fundamental laws does not imply the ability to start from these laws and to reconstruct the universe. Instead, at each level of complexity, entirely new phenomena appear, and the understanding of new behaviors requires research, which I think is as fundamental in its nature as any other. The constructionist hypothesis breaks down when confronted with the twin difficulties of uh, scale and complexity. Now, we have come a very long way since that early wake-up call. There are uh, many examples uh, of uh, emergence. Uh, I will mention one old hat example, which is superconductivity. And uh, there are many, there are a host of uh, new hat examples, which are clustered around the recognition that uh, there, are, there is a topologically determined quantum matter. Uh, this is very interesting because uh, topological numbers are um, integers, they are global, uh, they are uh, stable against uh, uh, large, cla kind, large class of deformations. They are properties of the emergent uh, system. Um, I'm not qualified to talk about this. Luckily, uh, some of the world leaders and pioneers in this field are uh, uh, such as uh, Duncan Haldane, Charlie Kane, Subhi Sachdev, Jainendra Jain, they are presenting this phase of physics. And uh, you will get a flavor of the ongoing second quantum revolution through their talks. This uh, particular part, I will end with the words of Xiao Gang Wen, who is one of the pioneers in this field. Uh, the common theme is the principle of emergence, which states that the properties of materials are mostly determined by how the particles are organized in the material. This is different from the point of view that the properties of material should be uh, determined by the components that form the material. In fact, all materials are made of the same components, electrons, protons, and neutrons. So we cannot use the richness of components to understand the richness of the materials. The various properties of different materials originate from the various ways in which the particles are organized. Uh, these organizations are called uh, orders. Different orders really lead to different pro properties of matter, which in turn, uh, different kinds of quantum matter, which in turn lead to different uh, properties of materials. Uh, I will, uh, to give an illustration of this, I will start with an extremely uh, concrete, uh, simple example, which is the ammonia molecule. Uh, you see, the common picture of the ammonia molecule is what I have shown on the right-hand side in what is called a ball and stick diagram. It consists of uh, three uh, hydrogen atoms and uh, a nitrogen atom at the top. It is a pyramid. Uh, this uh, is an asymmetric arrangement of uh, nitrogen and hydrogen molecules. 
It is not consistent with the symmetry of the laws of motion of the constituents, which are the nuclei and the electrons. But actually, uh, it turns out that there is another state with the same energy in which uh, the nitrogen atom is below the hydrogen plane at exactly the same distance in exactly the same form. And these two mix quantum mechanically, that is, they mix because of the laws of motion. Uh, as a result of this, symmetry is restored and the ground state is symmetric. In ammonia, this mixing happens very fast. It happens at the rate of about 10 to the 10 times per second. This is known as ammonia inversion. However, we, um, well, uh, we here meaning mostly chemists who think about such things, uh, they think of ammonia in the way I have shown, namely as a pyramid with N nitrogen at the top. Because that works, I mean, that's very useful for many, many properties of ammonia molecules and their derivatives. On the other hand, suppose we had looked at symmetric states only, we might not have noticed the pyramidal emergent broken symmetry form, which is crucial for the properties of ammonia. So this uh, problem uh, is uh, sort of easily redressed uh, in the case of ammonia, but it is especially stark when the number of interacting constituents, such as in complex systems, is of the order of an Avogadro number, which is about 10 to the power 23. So the time scale for restoration of broken symmetry is not as small as 10 to the power minus 10 seconds, but could be as large as the age of the universe. So what, what follows? The broken symmetry state or the emergent state is what we have. The symmetry which is broken may be obvious, like that of continuous rotation and translation, which is, be, which is broken to one of only some rotations and translations in a crystalline solid. Or it may not be obvious as a phase symmetry in a superconductor. The broken symmetry state uh, has novel properties, sometimes which are very evident. For example, when you kick a stone, you, you well, it hurts, and that is the rigidity. The other uh, reason why I believe that uh, there may be fundamental mysteries lurking in complex systems is diversity. That is, our surprise at the mysteries the world unrolls is actually a consequence of our limitations as uh, individuals and as a society, as a collective, collectively. Uh, it, uh, one quotation which I um, like to repeat uh, is from the play Hamlet by Shakespeare. Hamlet said to his fellow student and friend, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Of course, philosophy at, in those days meant uh, uh, everything. Uh, natural philosophy meant science. So the point is that the sheer variety of nature, which we have been extending by our increasing ability to make new kinds of things, to synthesize them, leads to unexpected properties. These consequences are specially pronounced and humanly accessible in the frontier of the complex. The material substrate of the complex is uh, seems very trite, but the strangest phenomena may reside there just because of the uh, complexity of the system. Okay, now I will give an example uh, of um, emergent behavior of a complex system, which is a very famous example. Uh, this is of superconductivity, which was discovered in Mercury in 1911 by Kamerling Onnes, uh, actually by his student uh, in Leiden. Uh, he found that uh, mercury, which is a solid at uh, temperatures of the order of four or five Kelvin, degrees Kelvin, uh, it uh, is a reasonably standard solid with a non-zero resistance, which electrical resistance, which decreases the decreasing temperature. Below that, the resistivity or the resistance suddenly decreases. Now, um, does it decrease to zero? Well, we can never tell, but uh, it seems to decrease to uh, immeasurably small values. Uh, so to check that, uh, so people have, uh, done experiments on niobium coils, uh, niobium becomes superconducting. Uh, they found that the current flowing in a superconducting niobium coil 
does not decay at least for 150,000 years. For normal niobium, it is uh, 10 to the power minus 13 years. That is a few seconds. Now, actually, or a few microseconds, milliseconds. Uh, actually, uh, superconductors, uh, the, the other property of superconductors, besides their uh, manifest uh, zero electrical resistance, uh, which uh, at least physicists find very characteristic, is that they are perfect diamagnets, namely that no magnetic field penetrates this. This was discovered by Meissner and Oceanfeld in 1933. So, and it, through many experiments, it is clear that it's a novel state of matter. It's a common low temperature state of matter. This is probably not that well appreciated. For example, uh, almost uh, uh, half, more than half the metals, uh, the elemental metals are superconducting at the lowest temperature. Now, uh, the question is, uh, why is it that uh, in the same piece of uh, material uh, on cooling uh, below a certain rather low temperature, uh, something extremely strange happens. Now, this mystery attracted the attention of almost all great physicists of the time of the 20th century, like Einstein, Heisenberg, and so on. Um, I would like to mention um, about this emergent behavior of a uh, metal, uh, this, uh, this emergent superconducting behavior of a metal, uh, some ideas which work. One idea which was actually proposed by London in 1948 is uh, that this whole superconductor, which consists of an Avogadro number of electrons, or more or less of the order of that, is in a single quantum state with a phase. Uh, this uh, is a sort of macroscopic quantum mechanics. It is quantum mechanics, not on an atomic or subatomic scale, but on a macroscopic scale. Now, this uh, is to be appreciated because it is uh, generally the case that uh, classical laws of motion are sufficient to describe uh, things on human scale of the order of a meter. And the quantum nature of matter uh, with new laws of motion uh, blending into classical ones becomes evident only at atomic scales. Uh, this is uh, because the quantum constant or the Planck's constant H is very small. And as a result, the atomic scale A, which is also called the Bohr radius, uh, is of the order of an angstrom. It's very, very small. In superconductors, quantum effects are present on the scale of a meter. And this was picturesquely described by a, a famous physicist called Casimir in the 1930s. He said that, look, over miles of dirty lead wire, uh, you find this effect. Mm. Uh, of course, for that reason, uh, people felt that it's a very good uh, place where, um, um, whether, where, whether, where the question of whether quantum mechanics is just a very good approximation for nature or is an exact theory uh, could be tested. Uh, one of the people who uh, was uh, for many years involved in this was Leggett. Uh, so far, uh, we have found no evidence for any uh, alternative. Now, that is the sort of um, basic uh, phenomenon and a very crude uh, um, idea about why there could be such a thing as a superconductor. Uh, in 1950, Ginzburg and Landau developed a deep and successful hypothesis for superconductivity, which was actually based on this, that idea, namely that the superconductor as a whole, not one electron, but the collection of all these electrons is characterized by a wave function with a single phase. Uh, so suppose this wave function is uh, uh, called uh, psi. They proposed a nonlinear Schrodinger-like equation which this wave function satisfies. This uh, equation is uh, somewhat like that of a single particle, uh, single quantum mechanical particle. They showed that the solution of this equation can describe a state of zero electrical resistance uh, and non-zero phase rigidity uh, with the phase being the same throughout the superconductor uh, when the uh, magnitude of this uh, 
uh, wave function delta uh, is uh, non-zero. They also worked out assuming physically motivated parameters for this uh, Schrodinger-like equation. Many consequences for the uh, substance which satisfies this equation, and they showed that uh, it agrees with what we see. This is an example, uh, I think perhaps the most successful example, uh, of the description of an emergent property of a complex system at the level at which we see its emergent behavior. So this is called a phenomenological theory. But the constants or the parameters which determine this behavior originate from atomic level properties, uh, which uh, are uh, at a scale which is 10 to the power minus eight times uh, smaller, 10 to the power eight times smaller. So there is a huge difference in scales between the atomic level um, properties which determine the uh, parameters uh, or constants of this phenomenological field. The question then is, how do we connect the parameters of this phenomenological theory with the properties of the underlying constituents? Namely, what is this delta? What is this phi? What is this nonlinear Schrodinger equation? We know that uh, a single particle has a Schrodinger equation. Formally, a collection of interacting particles also has a uh, Schrodinger equation, but uh, generally we cannot solve it. So we have to find the meaning of the other ingredients of the Schrodinger equation, like uh, the mass-like object of this uh, um, Schrodinger-like equation, the potential in which, uh, uh, which determines this wave function. Uh, this happened in 1957, Bardeen, Cooper and Schieffer, known as BCS, developed a microscopic theory starting from the constituent electrons. It is based on the idea that the superconductor is a coherent superposition of bound pairs of nearly 10 to the power 23 electrons. These bound pairs are called uh, Cooper pairs uh, um, after their discoverer. Uh, two electrons uh, of opposite spins and of opposite momenta in a clean system effectively attract and bind each other. Now, this attraction is very peculiar, I mean, very counterintuitive because electrons being of the same charge should repel each other. But uh, it turns out that uh, there is an attraction which is mediated by phonons. This attraction in many systems overwhelms the natural Coulomb repulsion. And as a result of this attraction, uh, the electrons necessarily bind to each other below a certain temperature. Then if you have these Cooper pairs and you can describe the material as a collection of these Cooper pairs uh, with all the same phase, uh, uh, one, uh, the material which consists of such a collection of coherent super Cooper pairs is a superconductor. The um, Bardeen, Cooper and Schieffer, actually Gorkov, um, identified the uh, wave function used by Ginzburg and Landau as a certain uh, amplitude of the uh, certain thermodynamic average of the electron pair field, which I have written down here. Uh, it is average of A down and uh, A up, both at uh, the uh, point R and at the time T. Uh, so by doing this, they were able to discover the atomic level origin of uh, superconductivity of the pairs of the parameters assumed in the Ginzburg Landau theory. Now, uh, I mentioned this also for a selfish reason. Uh, the reason is that uh, the, that superconductivity see, seems to be a source of major mysteries. Uh, one example is a uh, high temperature superconductivity in the cupids, uh, which was discovered by Bednorz and Miller in 1986. Uh, they discovered that a certain family of cupids uh, is super, uh, which uh, is superconducting at uh, unusually high temperatures. Uh, in, when they are not superconducting, they are actually very bad metals. Uh, for example, uh, lanthanum cuprate, uh, which is one uh, member of the family of uh, cuprate superconductors, uh, looks uh, like a black uh, tooth powder. 
you know there used to be uh, something called bandar chap kala dantmanjan uh, so this it looks like that uh, the superconducting transient temperature in these uh, materials is typically of the order of uh, 100 degrees kelvin whereas for the previously known superconductors the superconductivity occurs below 25 degrees kelvin in uh, lanthanum cuprate doped with strontium the maximum value of superconducting transition temperature is of the order of about 40 degrees now uh, in these systems uh, there is only repulsion there is no attraction there is no phonon induced attraction which can overwhelm that repulsion uh, so superconductivity per force has to be of a different uh, kind uh, so the question which uh, is not uh, unusual uh, is whether one can make sense of the occurrence of superconductivity in these uh, at high temperatures in these systems which have no electron attraction but only strong electron repulsion so i'll spend a little time talking about this mystery Uh, there have been a very very large number of attempts to understand how this happens uh, one attempt which is due to some of us i am going to mention now uh, this is uh, due to subinan banerji chandan das gupta and myself all at the indian institute of science uh, the work started more than 10 years ago and is still going on there are a large number of papers on this subject by us uh it's a phenomenological approach to the problem of uh, uh, having superconductivity in such a uh, system in which the electrons strongly repel each other there is no uh, phonon induced attraction so before i talk about that i will um, say a few things about uh, these uh, cuprates uh, beginning with their uh, structure Uh, and uh, also say something about uh, where superconductivity occurs in the systems uh, in terms of uh, uh, its location in the space of uh, temperature and uh, uh, doping by uh, strontium for example in the case of lanthanum cuprate so here i am showing a, a unit cell uh, of lanthanum cuprate Uh, you can see that it's uh, somewhat long, and uh, uh, the unit cell is about maybe eleven angstroms long, and maybe about four angstroms or three angstroms uh, uh, wide. Uh, it consists of uh, well, I mean, uh, just for convenience, uh, has, I've shown these. Uh, not I, the person who made this figure, has shown these as uh, red spheres. These are oxygen atoms. the blue ones are copper atoms um and uh, the green ones are lanthanum uh if you substitute some lanthanum atoms by strontium then you have lanthanum uh, cuprate doped with strontium and at a certain level of uh, doping which is called hole doping uh, superconductivity develops now the structure of uh, lanthanum cuprate for um, fuses Uh, is uh, far too complicated and uh, so they simplify it uh, to uh, essentially uh, square plane or square planes which are these and uh, these which are separated from each other by rather large distances on an atomic scale uh, each uh, square plane looks some hot like this uh, there are these four oxygen atoms there is this uh, copper atom uh and uh, why do we do this we do this because these planes are the electronically most interesting uh, objects where superconductivity seems to reside uh it does so because uh, copper in these systems has a what is called the d9 configuration that is the filled d shell will have 10 electrons this has 9 electrons so the d shell is not totally filled it is unfilled now if we substitute a, a fraction of lanthanum atoms with uh, strontium then um, i will show a kind of phase diagram uh, which shows uh, where superconductivity exists in this uh, space so this is the space of temperature and uh, uh, hole doping that is uh, the number of 
diffraction of uh, strontium atoms in lanthanum cuprate. Uh, uh, the fraction of strontium atoms uh, replacing lanthanum. Now you notice that uh, in the undoped uh, lanthanum cuprate, well, there is an uh, there is an uh, there is a, this yellow thing is supposed to describe an antiferromagnet. Uh, so uh, so it is an antiferromagnet below the stem, antiferromagnetically ordered below this temperature. So, and it is actually an insulator above the temperature either. Also, though it is not antiferromagnetic order, antiferromagnetically ordered. So this is a very peculiar thing. This is, uh, that is it's an insulator uh, through and through. Uh, this is uh, an unusual thing because uh, uh, this system has an odd number of electrons. And uh, if you have an odd number of electrons, conventional band theory, suggests that simply on the basis of the counting of the number of electrons, the thing ought to be a metal. So the thing which ought to be a metal is actually an insulator. Now, if you take this insulator and uh, what, I, what I call dope, dope it uh, with the strontium, which is called hole doping, then um, uh, beyond a certain doping, you come across a superconducting phase. This is the phase which has a uh, in general, a fairly high maximum transition temperatures of the order of 100 degrees. There are uh, other uh, strange uh, things associated with this um, phase diagram. Uh, what is called the pseudo gap phase, a strange metal phase, and what is called a Fermi liquid phase is not quite a Fermi liquid. Uh, I will not um, even talk about those things. Now, uh, what I will do now is to briefly summarize our approach. Uh, our approach uh, focuses on uh, the um, copper oxide uh, planes. Uh, and here, uh, as I said, um, these are the copper atoms, blue ones, and the red ones are the oxygen atoms. Hmm. Uh, now, uh, uh, you see, there is a uh, an unfilled uh, D shell here, which you can think of as having one hole in the filled D shell, uh, or because of crystal field splitting and so on and so forth, you can actually think of as having one electron. Uh, now, uh, if there is an electron here, obviously, uh, if there is to be superconductivity, there have to be electron pairs, which also has been um, uh, confirmed experimentally that there are electron pairs in these systems. Uh, so if there are two electron pairs, the other electron cannot be here because they repel each other very strongly. So uh, what I have shown here, for instance, is that uh, uh, one possibility is that one electron is here and the other electron is there and uh, somehow there is an effective attraction between them, not due to phonons, but uh, due to repulsion. And uh, therefore, as a result of that attraction, these two form what we call the bond pairs. That is, you can uh, mathematically think of this as uh, a pair residing at the center of this uh, line. Uh, the attraction between these two uh, is a kind of a, uh, it's an antiferromagnetic coupling, which is inevitable in systems with strong local electron electron repulsion. That is, if two electrons sitting at the same site uh, repel each other, uh, then necessarily two electrons, uh, um, one here and one there, uh, with opposite spins, will attract each other. Uh, so, this is actually the origin, we have been known for a long time. This is the origin of uh, antiferromagnetism in insulators. is extremely common in insulators. Antiferromagnetism is the common thing, uh, whereas uh, ferromagnetism is more common in much more common in metals. Uh, okay, so uh, that is a side remark. Now the point is this: that uh, in this highly electron repulsive system, uh, you can have uh, intersite Cooper pairs. Uh, which may be called bond Cooper pairs. Now, uh, the, this by itself does not ensure superconductivity. What is needed further is that uh, these bond pairs, uh, which can be described by an amplitude and a phase, uh, these bond pair phases should be the same throughout the crystal. 
Now, so uh, what we have, um, are, we have proposed a model in which a, a bond pair here and a, a bond pair, let us say here, they interact with each other. And this interaction is uh, effectively antiferromagnetic as a result of which uh, uh, below a certain temperature, these bond pairs uh, fall into a state of a single phase. Uh, so uh, superconductivity in these systems, these systems is emerging. It emerges as a result of the interaction between Cooper pairs. Uh, the uh, 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 interesting uh, point uh, is uh, uh, that uh, uh, the interaction between uh, these uh, Cooper pairs is antiferromagnetic, uh, or well, uh, is such that the phase of this Cooper pair, the phase of that Cooper pair, are exactly pi by two. Uh, as a result of which, the superconductivity has a kind of a, an angular momentum symmetry, which is called a deviation symmetry. Which is also uh, okay. Uh, so, with this uh, phenomenological model, we have been able to describe successfully and quantitatively a very large number of the observed properties of Q-trade superconductors in the temperature hole density plane. Uh, I will show an example in the next slide. So, in this model, no phononic blue is required and d waves superconductivity emerges naturally. Uh, but obviously, this is not a complete theory. What we need is an atomics level theory which describes the quantum dynamics of electrons, uh, interacting lattice electrons, and which gives rise to the hypothesized phenomenological theory with the assumed physically motivated parameters. This is, uh, we, we don't have it yet. So the mystery of cubic superconductivity is not fully solved. There are, in addition, a very large number of important observed effects such as the ubiquitous occurrence of density wave correlations in these superconductors uh, in the cube rates, uh, quantum oscillation, uh, quantum oscillations in the diamagnetic susceptibility of these superconductors, and the strong experimental evidence for what may be called a quantum critical point at zero temperature and at a particular hole doping. Uh, uh, so, in addition to the occurrence of B wave superconductivity, these uh, uh, observed facts, they also have to be integrated into a comprehensive atomic level theory, which we well don't have. Uh, all right, in this slide, I show uh, the, in our phenomenological model, uh, the electron energy spectrum, that is the energy spectrum of an electron with energy H slash omega, uh, with respect to the Fermi energy or the chemical potential and uh, with wave vector uh, uh, K. Uh, now, K, what does K mean? Uh, okay, so uh, the energy omega is with respect to the Fermi energy. Now, the Fermi energy is the energy of the last occupied state of the electron. Uh, these electronic states uh, uh, form in this two-dimensional uh, approximation to the system, uh, a, 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 the, the uh, space of states is a, described by uh, ky and kx. The occupied states are these, uh, and the unoccupied states are these, and therefore the um, uh, ky and k can also be parameterized by this angle. Uh, and uh, one also likes to um, talk about uh, this kx, uh, ky uh, space in terms of uh, the node of the pair wave function being here and the anti-node of the pair wave function being there. Uh, what uh, this uh, particular slide shows is uh, uh, the uh, uh, energy spectrum of uh, elect the, the, the uh, spectral density of uh, electrons uh, as a function of uh, um, how phi varies. You see here phi is zero and phi is continuously varying, uh, going up like this, which means that uh, you are uh, the electron momentum is changing smoothly from here to there. Mm. Uh, 
so as this happens, you notice interestingly that uh, the electron energy spectrum, which was which had a single peak, uh, has a double peak. Uh, the separation between the two peaks increases, and uh, this feature depends on temperature. The model calculation we have done is for a system with a whole doping of 0.1 and a transient temperature of 66 degrees. Uh, you notice also that as the temperature increases, uh, the extent uh, in uh, uh, phi uh, of this uh, single peak location uh, increases. So this is under uh, prediction of this uh, theory, which uh, of course is um, well uh, verified uh, because it has uh, been observed that uh, in these systems, you have actually Fermi arcs rather than Fermi nodes. If you had a Fermi, Fermi surface, if you had a Fermi line or Fermi surface, uh, then this single peak would extend or be, would be there for all values of K. Uh, whereas in these systems, it is there only for some values of K. And uh, the values of K for which it is there changes the temperature. So the length of the Fermi arc changes the temperature, which is also a fact which has been observed. So uh, we have such uh, predictions which have been uh, quantitatively compared with the measurements in this particular, in the last case, uh, they've been compared with the measurements of uh, angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy, which actually measures the energy spectrum of electrons uh, as a function of uh, its uh, uh, momentum. Okay, the next thing I want to uh, mention uh, is uh, uh, the fact that the uh, enormous variety of uh, systems, uh, in, uh, of complex systems, which you can ma make, uh, which exist in nature, uh, that uh, itself leads to many mysteries. Uh, for example, uh, one of them is uh, metamaterials about which I think Sir John Pendry talked last week, last Saturday, 20th of February. These metamaterials have been synthesized and we are beginning to now appreciate that these are properties. Uh, I will talk about another uh, mysterious phenomenon, which is a, probably a result of the variety of uh, complex systems in nature. Uh, this, uh, was recognized, I think, in about 1986. It is not uh, well understood. Uh, mm, the same phenomenon occurs in uh, synthetic materials, which have also been explored, and uh, similar results have been found. This phenomenon is the linear resistivity of metals. Uh, two of us, namely Hassan at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai, and myself, have been working on this uh, uh, for almost a year, and we feel that uh, this uh, ongoing work is heading in the right direction. Uh, before I talk about what we have done or what we are trying to do, uh, I would like to mention a few uh, things which uh, give some sort of perspective on this uh, um, uh, linear resistivity of metals. The first point is that the resistivity of clean metals is almost always directly proportional to temperature, except at very low temperatures. That is, you take any metal, uh, copper, aluminum, niobium, uh, uh, these are elemental metals, or you can have uh, composite metals. Uh, it is a resistivity proportional to temperature, uh, and uh, except at low temperature. At low temperatures, it deviates from linearity. In a particular class of clean systems, this linear resistivity is large, seems to increase uh, without saturating at what may be what is known as the quantum uh, upper limit. See, this quantum upper limit is a guess. Uh, it's a guess based on the following idea uh, that uh, suppose uh, uh, the um, uh, wavelength of the uh, electron, which is a, the, the Broglie wavelength of the electron of the Fermi energy, uh, that uh, is approximately of the same size uh, uh, 
um, as the distance an electron has to travel before it scatters. Uh, well, that should define something, uh, some characteristic uh, uh, conductivity or resistivity uh, below which the mean free path for collisions uh, cannot go, or at least you have to change your description completely uh, in order to describe what happens then. Uh, now, this, uh, so what I wanted to say here was that uh, in this particular class of clean systems, uh, the resistivity is not only large, but uh, it does not seem to uh, recognize that there is an upper quantum limit to resistivity. Uh, it seems to increase linearly well beyond that limit without saturating. This class of materials in which it occurs, uh, they, all, they, are all, they all seem to be characterized by strong local repulsion between electrons. That is, these are what is called strongly correlated metals. In a more uh, sort of colloquial way, I could say that uh, these are metals in which electrons move around from one lattice side to another, strongly avoiding each other. Uh, let me show some examples. See, this is perhaps the first uh, clear observation of the phenomenon. This was done, in, I think, in 1986. Uh, the authors, Waxak, Fury, and so on, they um, uh, took a single crystalline flake of uh, bismuth 220. This is just a physicist shorthand for a cuprate, uh, which uh, um, has bismuth in it. Uh, now, uh, they found that they plotted the resistivity as a function of temperature. They found that the resistivity increases linearly with temperature. Uh, starting from very suspiciously low temperatures, seven degrees at uh, fairly high temperatures like 700 degrees. Uh, since then, of course, many measurements have been made. For instance, uh, here you, I show a number of cuprates um, whose resistivity is plotted as a function of temperature. Uh, it's, uh, there is some non-linearity in the beginning, but then after that, it becomes linear in temperature. Uh, just for uh, the record, I show here uh, the quantum limit or the mott joffe regel limit of residue. That is, uh, it uh, ought not to be more than this. It ought to saturate to this value, uh, which is a low temperature quantum mechanical value. Okay. Now, this phenomenon is actually very general. Uh, for example, about two years ago, uh, or three years ago, a new material was discovered called twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, now, this just consists of two layers of graphene, uh, very close to each other. Uh, and now, suppose you twist one layer with respect to the other. It turns out that at a magic twist angle of about 1.1 degrees, uh, the electron energy bands of this uh, uh, graphene, uh, twisted by layer graphene, are nearly flat. As a result of this extreme flatness, the electron kinetic energy is very, very small. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, the system is effectively strongly correlated for uh, twist angles uh, uh, around this value. So what uh, Herrero and so on, who uh, uh, did this experiment, uh, on uh, who discovered this uh, twisted bilayer graphene and many phenomena in this twisted bilayer graphene, they did was to uh, measure uh, resistivity of twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, here is shown on the y-axis uh, as a function of temperature for different values of uh, twist angles. Uh, they found that if the twist angles are close to the magic angle of 1.1 degree, uh, the resistivity is linear to, uh, well, I mean, uh, to, let us say, 40 degrees Kelvin. Now, it may not, the 40 degrees Kelvin may not appear to be uh, enormous, but you see the Fermi temperature of these uh, uh, things is of the order of uh, 40 degrees Kelvin also. So, uh, one could put it uh, this way that the unsaturated linearity in these uh, systems of resistivity in these systems it, uh, extends over an astonishingly wide temperature range from about zero Kelvin to a temperature of the order of the Fermi temperature. 
in conventional materials, it is simply not possible to explore uh, any uh, behavior of visibility over this regime because uh, um, you can make measurements uh, maybe till about um, a few hundred degrees Kelvin uh, uh, because then the thing starts decomposing or it melts or oxygen starts coming out of it, etc. So it changes its composition, it becomes a different material. Here, the, on the same scale, uh, the uh, data are available about, uh, to about 20,000 degrees Kelvin. Now, there is a seductive explanation, uh, explanatory idea, uh, which I will not talk about, uh, partly because I don't know anything about it. Uh, this is uh, called the Planckian dissipation limit. Uh, and it is the idea that the current dissipation rate has a Planckian limit of uh, kbt by h slash uh, and that uh, these materials are for some reason near this limit and that uh, this leads to the observed non-saturating linear resistivity. There is actually no theory yet for models which can be considered realistic, that is my view. Our view of this, our approach to this problem is quite traditional. Uh, the basic physical idea is the following, that uh, if you have a uh, material which consists of uh, which you know in which the atoms are on a lattice uh, so the electron has to uh, hop from one lattice point to another uh, which then means that the charge on a particular lattice site must fluctuate in time unless this happens there is no transport of charge there is no electrical conductivity so the uh, primary thing uh, for charge transport in lattice system is uh, the fluctuation of charge uh, at a particular site. Hmm. In a lattice with strongly coded electrons, there is a strong tendency for the number at a site to be nearly fixed. This is simply because if you uh, change that number, for example, if you add an electron to a site where there is already an electron, uh, then uh, uh, these two electrons repel each other very strongly and therefore the energy of this uh, two electron state is very high. Uh, as a result of this, uh, for, for example, uh, the, you have at magnetic moments uh, because the existence and value of atomic magnetic moments depends on the electron number and its stability at a site. Mm. Uh, so, uh, in spite of this fact, the charge on a site must fluctuate for current to flow. So what do we have to do? We have to find the uh, on-site charge fluctuation spectrum for a lattice, uh, find its quantum scale, uh, and uh, then uh, we argue uh, that uh, for temperatures above that quantum scale, we expect the resistivity to be linear. This is out of a classical equipartition theorem. Um, it's not so difficult to show that. Uh, okay, so this is an interesting um, thing. I mean, because uh, you see, uh, there is a no upper limit in temperature to the fluctuation of charge at a particular site. I mean, if, 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 if it is a metal, the charge at a particular site has to uh, fluctuate. Mm. And if, it, if you are above the characteristic quantum scale, for this uh, charge fluctuation, then resistivity has to be linear. Okay, so let me um, go ahead. Okay, I mean, this is a very simple look, simple sounding idea. We have not been able to reduce these ideas to a calculation, either by pure simulation or by formulating an analytical theory. Uh, the problem is actually quite difficult and it has to do with the peculiar electron dynamics of strongly correlated systems. Uh, there are many, many, uh, I would say creative, very creative ideas such as emergent particles, fractalization, etc. But there is a no uh, solution. So I will not uh, uh, go into um, what we have, what we are trying to do, etc. Uh, we believe that we have found an approximation for large spatial, uh, for large spatial dimension, uh, which uh, seems to be accurate in other contexts, uh, in which one can connect the on-site charge dynamics. Uh, or onset charge relaxation to the conductivity. Uh, we still have quite a distance to go. Now, the point I want to emphasize is the following. The material substrate of the mysteries and its explication in terms of basic principles are obviously connected. 
The connection can most often be seen relatively easily in this area. And therefore, there are fundamental mysteries uh, in my view in this area. And uh, it is also possible uh, that uh, they can be understood. Okay, now there are other frontiers about which I, I won't say anything. I will uh, stop in a minute or two. Um, you see, there are two frontiers, large and small. Um, uh, people have talked about this, will be talking about this uh, extensively in this lecture series. Uh, in the next, uh, min in a few minutes, I will take a very few uncertain baby steps on uh, the uh, dangerous frontier or the fourth frontier, unclear. You see, as physicists, we believe that there is no fourth frontier and that as uh, our understanding expands, uh, it will cover everything. So the question is, is this the right way to look at all those foundational questions, which not only many scientists, but many magazines uh, mention in their lists of great unsolved mysteries, uh, you know, there may be, they, they say, well, there are seven great uh, unsolved problems. Somebody says there are 11 great. Somebody says there are 20 great, etc., etc. But whatever it is, uh, they believe that uh, these unsolved problems will be solved within science itself. Hmm. Uh, or is it that uh, for some of which uh, one has to go outside? Uh, I do not know whether physics has a central, central role in this. And obviously, I don't know anything about this, so I will simply quote uh, some what some people have said about this. I will start with an innocuous sounding statement. The basis of all knowledge is experience. So this is perfectly reasonable. Uh, for example, the motto of the Royal Society, uh, which is one of the oldest organizations for promoting and recognizing natural science, is uh, nullius in verba. That is on the word of no one, that is, take no one's word for it, do it. Now, uh, interestingly, this uh, sentence, the basis of all knowledge is, is experience, is uh, uh, the first sentence in the book of lectures on Raja Yoga by Swami Vivekananda. Now, if we admit the validity of such a statement, do we have to have a larger integrated view of human knowledge of which science is a part? What is this view? I do not know. And therefore, I will simply quote his typically forthright and clear assertions. One of his assertions is, all our knowledge is based on experience. This includes scientific knowledge of the uh, knowledge of the outer world, of external nature, and religious no or spiritual knowledge is of inner world of our inner nature. In acquiring knowledge, we make use of generalizations and generalizations uh, depend on observations. You observe facts, generalize, and then draw conclusions. Uh, but the conclusion, uh, the, uh, the in, uh, of the conclusion, the in, uh, internal nature of man, man of thought can never be had um, without observation. Mm. Uh, in the external world, there are uh, many instruments we have invented for this purpose. In the in, in, inner world, we have no instrument to help us. Yet, we know, we must observe in order to have a science. Without a proper analysis of such observations, any science will be hopeless, mere theorizing. Hmm. Then he goes on to say that are the same methods of investigation which we apply to sciences and knowledge outside to be applied to the science of religion? In my opinion, this must be so. And I'm also of the opinion that the sooner it is done, the better. If a religion is destroyed as a result of in such investigations, it, is, it was all the time useless, unworthy superstition, and the sooner it goes, the better. Then, of course, he describes reason in just a sentence. What do I mean by reason? I mean what every educated man or uh, woman at the present time means to apply the discovery of secular knowledge to religion. Finally, I end with a statement by Max Planck, who is uh, an iconic and a revolutionary figure in our field. He says, science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature. And that is because in the last analysis, we ourselves are part of nature and therefore part of the mystery we are trying to solve. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much, Professor Ramakrishnan. Thank you so much. Uh, let's have a, a round of applause uh, for Professor Ramakrishnan. <laughs>
Okay. Um, Professor Ramakrishnan, is it okay if we can have a few queries uh, from the audience? Sure. I don't uh, promise to answer, but yes. <laughs> it would be a good answer, but yes. Please have okay. questions. All right, great. So, um, okay. All right, so this one is uh, kind of a, of a philosophical nature, and I think uh, uh, one can probably not find a better person than you to answer this. So it is a query from Sai Varun, who is an engineer, as he says, and he says that as an engineer, I sometimes feel why there is so much curiosity to search everything. Like some of them would be worth it, but it comes to more of a satisfaction of discovery, isn't it? Please give your opinion about this. Uh, I Yes, you are right. Um, as human beings, we cannot help uh, being curious. Uh, and uh, uh, well, this curiosity, uh, systematic curiosity has led us somewhere. So I cannot say that uh, uh, only because it leads you somewhere uh, like a smartphone uh, that uh, you should be curious. You should be curious. Okay. Uh, then there is a question from the uh, from uh, the same uh, from from Sai Varun again, and the question is. Um, okay, I I, I don't know. <laughs> Well, okay, let me just ask it. It's, uh, the question is, why has NASA used plutonium isotope for energy supply in the Perseverance rover? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's uh, um, compact uh, and uh, reliable uh, source of um, energy. All right. Uh, so, and there was a, a quick query by Devang Somvanshi, and the query is, what is a strange metal? What, what is, is strange, strange? What is strange metal? Yeah, what is a strange metal? Well, uh, uh, we know what is a, an unstrange metal. Um, um, copper, um, aluminium, they are all uh, normal metals. If you look at uh, their physical properties, uh, uh, their equilibrium properties, their uh, transport property, non-equilibrium properties like transport. So equilibrium means, uh, suppose you look at their specific heat, uh, you look at the transport, non-equilibrium like the resistivity. Uh, well, it, they behave in a certain way. And uh, there are um, theories which work, you know, which uh, can um, describe the way the uh, observations are. Uh, however, uh, in uh, strange metals, uh, we find uh, uh, all kinds of behavior. Uh, uh, well, not all kinds. We, we find a, find characteristic behavior uh, which uh, is uh, against uh, all our uh, experience so far. Mm. For instance, um, uh, in many strange metals, uh, we don't find uh, we find evidence against uh, the existence of uh, well-defined. Uh, Particles, particles with in which if you have a, well, a particular momentum, they have a well-defined energy, quasi-particles uh, as they are called. Huh? Um, we find, as I was trying to say, the resistivity uh, quite uh, unusual, uh, quite odd, um, at variance with uh, what you uh, expect. Uh, so these are uh, strange, yes. Okay. Uh, there's a query by Abhinav Dhavan, and uh, the question is, how do we determine that superconducting niobium, niobium coils have a characteristic current decay time scale of about 150,000 years? Uh, well, that's an upper limit. Uh, I think uh, it was an NMR experiment uh, in which... Uh, you know, if the current decayed, I mean, the current gives rise to a magnetic field, and uh, the magnetic field acts on the nucleus of the niobium atom. And uh, if the magnetic field changes with time, its resonance frequency will change. And uh, they did not uh, observe any notice, they did not notice any change in the resonance frequency over the period the experiment uh, was done, uh, which is. Um, say a few days, 
Um, you know, you measure the, look at the resonance today and you come back tomorrow and look at the resonance again and you find that there is no change. Um, and well, you can, I think they did it for maybe more than a day. Uh, so uh, from this, you can extrapolate and you can put a kind of an upper limit on the time scale. You can never, uh, that's the problem with many of the, many of such uh, uh, things. For example, uh, uh, you can go very close to the absolute of zero, uh, but uh, you can never um, uh, reach it. I mean, people have gone to um, fractions of a millionth of a degree, absolute zero, but uh, still you are not at absolute zero. Similarly, you are not at absolute zero of resistance, but you can say that uh, the current does not decay uh, measurably over uh, my period of experiment, uh, which is uh, sensitive to such things. Okay, Abhinav had another uh, question, which uh, is simply that uh, he asks, who were you quoting in the end before ma the Max Planck's quote? Swami Vivekananda. Okay. Uh, there's a query from Deepak Verma. Uh, the query is, uh, why superconductivity fails at room temperature? Mm, well, um... Uh, the, the theoretical physicist's answer would be that uh, it fails because uh, there are no bound uh, Cooper pairs. And uh, once there are no bound Cooper pairs and the, the question of their being in phase does not arise, uh, in that case, uh, the collection of electrons uh, is um, fairly uh, random. I mean, it has fairly random motions uh, because of um, temperature. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, cannot be superconducting. As a matter of fact, one of the um, major quests in modern um, science is to find a, a material which is a superconductor at room temperature. Now, suppose that happens. You see, uh, we can we don't at the moment we cannot uh, we can only uh, some we can only imagine some consequences. For instance, if it happens. Uh, you might have a, a quantum computer sitting on your desk uh, if you use uh, computers, or you can have a, uh, and, and, and that uh, quantum computer can be, uh, you know, as, uh, I mean, far more powerful, I mean, much smaller and far more powerful uh, if you're interested in such things again. Uh, or you can have a large number of uh, devices which use the fact that something is uh, superconducting at normal temperature. Um, most mundane of which is the fact that uh, you can um, pass current through superconducting wires at normal temperature without uh, the wire getting hot. And uh, this will uh, save a huge amount of energy. So, yes, it's a very big uh, quest. Uh, for a, a normal um, uh, uh, superconductivity occurring at uh, um, norm, I mean, room temperatures. There is a, no law of nature against it, but people have not been able to find such a material. Okay, uh, so in the absence of any more queries, maybe I would uh, squeeze in one of my own, uh, which is more of a observation slash comment. So I, I noticed, uh, so you talked about this uh, Planckian dissipation limit and uh, about uh, a, a an upper bound, which is uh, given by uh, essentially uh, this, uh, I mean, KT over H bar. Right. And the observation is that uh, about six years ago, uh, so, uh, so, I mean, uh, this is something that I came to know in the, uh, in the uh, string theory uh, community uh, rather recently. So there is a paper by the trio of uh, Maldesena, Schenker and Stanford in 2015 and they are actually uh, give a conjecture which has to do with uh, looking at the how chaos would grow in uh, thermal quantum systems. And by looking at what they call as out of time correlators. And uh, the claim is that uh, the chaos uh, would grow. Uh, they basically give an upper bound on the associated Lyapunov exponent. And that is exactly uh, this, uh, the upper bound on the current dissipation rate. I don't know if there is a connection there, but it's exactly the same. No, the, 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 obviously there is. A, I mean, there is a connection, but see, the problem uh, is uh, these are. Um, I don't know. I mean, firstly, uh, there is a question of establishing uh, um, the existence of a limit for uh, um, 
real contest metric systems, then there is a problem that, okay, you have this dissipation rate uh, limit uh, to which this uh, uh, real system is very close. Uh, but uh, then uh, in order to translate that into uh, resistivity, you have to take a few more steps or at least one more step, which is to assume that the dissipation rate uh, is of some particle. Unfortunately, in these systems, the particles are not well defined. And uh, so there are problems. I mean, okay, maybe I'm prejudiced, but uh, uh, but it's a, it is a fantastically, as I said, it's a very seductive, and I would say I will would say that it's a very uh, uh, important um, conjecture. Fine, fine. Uh, so I think uh, with that uh, we come to the end of this uh, beautiful uh, session with uh, Professor Ramakrishnan, and uh, thank you so much for your. Uh, um, the kind patience, uh, especially with the queries, and uh, thank you uh, for an, uh, um, obviously an incredible lecture. So I think uh, with that, I would uh, thank everybody for joining in, and uh, I would also uh, request uh, all those who are uh, to I mean, all those who are present uh, to kindly fill up the response form, which uh, the, uh, the the very cool. Uh, Hackers, as I call them, the Physical Astronomy Club students who have been helping us, especially with the tech support, have been posting as reminders. Please uh, do fill them up. So thank you so much. Uh, have a great weekend. And uh, thanks. Thank you, Professor Ramakrishnanji. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. OK, team, thanks a lot. So I think uh, I'm ending the meeting now. Thanks once again. Thank you.